I am Dana Francois. I have the honor and privilege of leading our work for economic development and the Haiti team, part of the Latin American and Caribbean team at the Kellogg Foundation. And I have the utmost honor of introducing my dear colleague, Sebastian Frias, who is my counterpart leading the same work in Mexico. And we have two of our dear partners, long-term partners, who will truly have an opportunity to share with you today the work that they're doing. And the first person that we have with us today is Juana, and I wanna make sure, Juana Lopez Diaz. And Juana is a master craftswoman in backstrap looms from Santiago El Pina in Chiapas, Mexico. She is the president and founder of the cooperative Choice Polavil, an honor and legal representative of the social enterprise Juxta Nation. She's a member of Ensemble Artesano, a collective of artisans composed of over 80 organizations. She's a psychologist and leads workshops in individual and group accompaniment. She's a Spanish Tutsi translator, social networker, sales professional, event organizer, and an intimate leader. Our second colleague, partner on here with us today is Patrick Dessous. Mr. Dessous is the executive director of Saint d'Appui et de Service aux entreprises locales et internationales. Anyone who knows Haitian organizations know that we love long names. Kasseli for short. A spin-off of Root Capital in Haiti, acting as a business support operator who offers a wide range of services to national and international enterprises, including government agencies, private sector organizations, former co-ops, and community-based organizations. Patrick serves as the Haiti, served at the Haiti Country Director of Woods Capital, an impact first agriculture lender providing credit and capacity building to small and growing agricultural businesses around Haiti and around the region. And before joining Root Capital, he worked as a senior business analyst at Foncosé. For those of you who know Foncosé, one of the largest microfinance institutions in Haiti. And Patrick holds a Bachelor of Accountant and Master of Taxation from Nova Southeastern University. Welcome, Patrick. All right, so welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, buenos dias. Bonjour. Uh, we really wanted to start uh, by framing the conversation. We will have a chance to do a little workshop, so you just have to bear with us for a few minutes, and then you can continue networking and engaging. Um, so Dana, you know, we talk about transformative investments. This panel is really focused on, on this uh, opportunities and mechanisms for impact first investments in Haiti and Mexico. Um, please help us understand better how do, how do we define transformative from, from the um, foundation perspective, specifically in the context of Haiti and Mexico, and can you provide some tangible examples of innovative finance and that are successfully catalyzing economic opportunities? The first thing that I'll start by saying is that my colleagues are all in the room, so do feel free to also ask them all of those questions and answers. They'll have amazing answers for you. The second thing that I will say, um, as a Kellogg Foundation, actually before we even start into kind of our story and what we wanna share with you, I think starting with assumptions is really kind of the first step. So fundamentally as an organization, and I would venture to say as people in, this, in, in the Kellogg Foundation, we truly attempt and believe in people's capacity, inherent ability to help themselves, and people's ability to change their communities and address their own problems. The reason why that's important is because fundamentally, before we start everything, the questioning of our mindset and our framework is fundamentally important. In the context of Haiti in Mexico, particularly rural Haiti and rural Mexico, for us, really questioning and, and testing our assumptions around, do we have asset-based framing in mind? 
or are we going in with a deficit mindset? And the reason why that, that's important is because when you see asset, you see opportunities, and you become patient, and you take the time to learn, and you believe what you're being told, and you think long term. So start first and foremost, an asset-based mindset rooted in equity. So with that in mind as a foundation, um, we, we started our place-based approach over a decade ago in Haiti and Mexico. And fundamentally for us, our values was operationalized and we continue to try to operationalize it. And it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. We have made mistakes and we've learned over the years. But we endeavor um, very strongly to focus on community voice and community leadership. Learn, 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 learn. Iterate and fail forward. When we make a mistake, we often see it as an opportunity to refine our approach. So for us, transformative means that if we are going to partner over the long term in Haiti and Mexico, and for us, long term means at least a generation, it means that the very conditions that create poverty, that create maternal um, morbidity, that create the very conditions that we know our communities are facing in Rohiti and Mexico, that those change over time. And they change based on the vision, leadership, agency of local leaders, local institutions, local communities. And we not just see change incrementally, we see deep change that essentially means that families are moving out of poverty, it means that small enterprises are growing. It means there are more small enterprises that are providing services. There's more capital. There's innovative capital, catalytic capital. And we see change not just at the individual level, but at the community level, at the systems level. And, and we also have many of our partners here, including Juana and Patrick, who really can share with you more in, deep, in deeper detail what the systems level change looks like. And, and I hope they can share with you as well what they've learned in terms of interacting with us because we really do see it as a two-way street and we endeavor to learn as we go along. And oh, there was a second part to the question. Okay. So I'll briefly say in terms of the second part to the question for the examples. Um, so when we think about partnership and collaboration, on one end, the key, the piece around additionality is critical. So what do we do, how do we partner as individual institutions, and how do we partner, whether it's to co-funding, so very intentionally talking to one another as different actors around capital in the ecosystem to either support similar work or exchange what we're learning, or more formal partnerships um, around blended finance structures. As an example, there are two examples that I would mention for now, and there are many others that I encourage you to engage with us around over the week. And my colleagues, again, are actually on this table. I'm pointing them out. So feel free to talk to them and ask them <laughs> for the questions. But I think two examples that I will mention. One, um, you probably know that the Kellogg Foundation, along with the Ford Foundation um, and other foundations a few years ago, issued social impact bond to really respond and face with the pandemic. And those social impact bonds, in our case, um, around $300 million was intended to not only support communities across um, all the range of investments that we've been supporting, education, health, family, economic security, to face the impact of the pandemic, but to also continue to catalyze and be responsive. And fast forward today, many of the partners who are here and many of the initiatives that we're lifting up here are initiatives that not only participated in the social impact bond, but are demonstrating the evidence of what happens when resources meet the challenge and the opportunity, and when it's locally led, what we see even in the worst of circumstances, giving challenges um, in communities. And the last piece that I will say as another example is our partnership with um, the Impact First Fund, with Global Partnership, which was a PRI that we seeded with $1 million, and then that $1 million was then um, stacked upon by um, global partnerships, by OPIC, and essentially launched a $50 million fund, which again, fast forward, has um, deals now in both countries around first loss um, and around fund financing to catalyze, again, um, the entrepreneur ecosystem in both countries. So I'll pause here. 
that was a lot to digest. But again, do engage with us over the week because we do see this as opening a conversation. Many of those entrepreneurs are here. They will be pitching. So engage with us, not just this week, but we hope it, as we continue to move this work forward. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Dana. And I'll expand a little bit. I don't want to repeat anything Dana already said. I'll just say that uh, we've had the privilege to focus in Mexico and Haiti in, in specific communities for the past 11, 12 years. And something that we understood was very important is thinking about positionality and really thinking about where we are placed uh, doing this work. Even if we are ourselves racialized people, we hold uh, positions of power. Uh, being in philanthropy is, is really being in a position of power. And also understanding that I think most of you could agree that if we're in this room, uh, we're part of the problem. We're part of the problem because we're benefiting of a structure that is unequal, but we can also be part of the solution. No? And that's really how we want to frame our work, uh, recognizing where we're at in that position of privilege, what we can do, what agency can we have, but specifically what ag agency we can have to follow local leadership. And for us, the, one of the key ingredients for success has been that, uh, that we could fund uh, growing organizations, urban organizations, na national and international organizations, but really what is the key for sustainability at the community level is community. So if we center community and their leadership, that's for us something that has been part of the recipe for success. Um, the, only, the other thing uh, we, we think it has been key and, and uh, really um, center to our strategy is really asking ourselves who is defining impact. And uh, we hear about metrics about climate change, uh, trees that are planted, uh, economic development targets, and we know those are important, but those metrics, do, do they actually mean anything to the communities that we're partnering with? Uh, is that the intended impact the community wants? Um, and who, and really identifying those power gaps between the measurement, the definition of the metrics, and who decides uh, what are we measuring. And the other piece I, I just wanted to mention is uh, how important for us has been to focus on narrative change and changing uh, very rooted um, narratives in, in the ecosystem. In, in Latin America, we still use a lot the, the term base of the pyramid which uh, kind of references to something that, that we, uh, the way we talk about racial equity in, at the Kellogg Foundation is addressing a false hierarchy of human value, no? really identifying that, unfortunately, in society, all oppressive systems hold a hierarchy. But unfortunately, in the impact sector, we've been talking about base of the pyramid as, as an object, as a place where we want to make business and we want to uh, make money out of and we're really trying to change that. We really, what we've been focusing on is how do we change the vision of um, communities that are facing poverty or other challenges instead of looking them as a business opportunity, looking uh, to these community leaders as partners, as entrepreneurs, as in, um, really uh, businessmen and women. Um, so I think that's, that's something else that we've been really working on. Um, and that we encourage everyone to, to shift that mindset around impact and around uh, how do we engage with community. And the last thing I'll say very briefly is how important taking the time to nurture these relationships are, how context is so important, and the partnership. The partnership, yes, with local communities, with local NGOs and nonprofits, uh, with companies, with other foundations, with funds, uh, with investment, and really this, this is the only way that we can uh, articulate ecosystems that really um, center communities, but also create uh, avenues for the participation of communities in different um, chains in the value chain. Uh, lastly, I'll say that uh, one key factor for us and why we, we came to SOCAP is thinking that we need more investment in Latin America, especially in, the, in places where uh, not many people want to invest. And the barriers we see is, uh, first of all, not uh, much interest in, in investing in these areas. And I think we can, we can say uh, maybe one of the reasons this session is not completely packed is because of that. That's one barrier that we face. But also is language. And for us, language is, is key to everything we do. It's paramount. Uh, 
Today we're not having translation with devices. Uh, we, we, we talked to SOCAP, it was complicated, but we will be doing translation. And we will be doing so because we think it's important. It's a statement for us uh, so that people can communicate. And uh, unfortunately, I don't uh, speak Sotil, which is Juana's language, but I, I speak Spanish and I will be translating for her. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you, Sebas. Um, and I'll build on something that Sebas said and we'll ask a question um, to Juana so that she has an opportunity to share with us. But one of the things that I would share briefly that is fundamentally, I think, important for us is that we've had the privilege over a decade to really see what, ch what change looks like when we talk about how we define impact. And we're reminded every day that so many of the challenges and contextual issues that communities are facing are historical. They're historical, they're systemic. So then there's an opportunity and there's an, a need to look at what does individuals and institutions need for the markets in the region, but also what are some of the systemic changes that are required in order to, again, see the kind of impact that Juana and Patrick are leading every day. So with that, Juana, um, would you please share with us your experience as a, as a Tutsil entrepreneur? You are the founder and owner of a social enterprise. You've partnered in many ways with other um, small enterprises. So you have a truly complex understanding and view of what does the conditions look like um, related to opportunities, but also the gaps around innovative financing. Hola, eh, muchas gracias por el espacio y por la oportunidad y estoy muy agradecida eh, al representar a las mujeres de los pueblos originarios de eh, Chiapas y México, eh, porque esto es un espacio que, que no se gana eh, y no se ve normalmente en los pueblos originarios, que una mujer hable eh, y que sea el centro de voz y que nos escuchen. Eh, para que más o menos entiendan el contexto de mi comunidad, les voy a platicar un poco de mi historia personal, de cómo fue el proceso para mí, que no fue tan, eh, tan fácil de salir desde mi casa, de pedir permiso a mis papás, de tomar cursos, diplomados y todo eso. Y no debería de ser así porque todas y todos tenemos los mismos derechos, pero desafortunadamente hay usos y costumbres en, en las comunidades y están todavía muy arraigados hacia nosotras como mujeres en los pueblos originarios y somos las que pagamos por, por todo eso, ¿no? del, eh, del rol de género, del, de cómo también eh, nos etiquetan la sociedad. So thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank for this space and the opportunity to share on representing and on behalf of the woman of Chiapas, the indigenous woman of Chiapas, and recognizing that these spaces are, are not, are earned, but are not common, uh, to have at the center of the stage the voice of a woman, uh, at the center of the stage uh, com community, um, I want to talk about my community and my context in my community, my personal story, how hard it was for me to go out of home and, and get out of home and community, um, and the role of women in communities. Um, it's very important that to recognize that we should all have the same rights, and unfortunately women don't have the same rights and the same opportunities as men. Uh, this is in part uh, because of tradition and some conservative views in my community, but unfortunately women are the ones who have to pay for, for um, this way of being. Um, and I just want to talk to you about the, the role of gender and the, some of the barriers I've had in my history. Yo desde los 15 años comencé como a tomar cursos, diplomados, sobre diferentes temas, porque evidentemente 
En, en mi casa tampoco se habla de, de muchos temas, como por ejemplo en salud sexual y reproductiva. Fue ahí donde me abrió tanto el panorama de conocerme a mí misma, de mis sueños, de lo que realmente quiero en, en la vida. Y eso también eh, me impulsó a trabajar eh, con las mujeres, con las jóvenes sobre todo, y siento yo que ahora ya me preguntan muchos, ¿cómo lo haces? ¿Cómo, cómo vas descubriendo ese camino? Porque queremos también que eh, tengamos esas experiencias eh, por el simple hecho de viajar, por ejemplo. Eso también las mujeres como que ya les motiva mucho a, a seguir preparándose también. So, uh, I've been taking courses since I was 15 years old. Uh, I've been preparing myself in many different topics. In, in my house, there were a lot of issues and key issues like reproductive uh, health that were not, not talked about. Um, and that really has helped me discover my dreams and my path in life. Uh, and that really helped me uh, discover my vocation in working with women, particularly young women. And now every, uh, people from my community come to me and ask me, how do you do it? How have you achieved this? Uh, How can we have the same experience that you are having? En los pueblos originarios creemos que cada persona, eh, ya sea lo que creemos en Dios, el universo, eh, nos manda a un propósito. Eh, por ejemplo, yo un día de estos cursos diplomados que me asisto, eh, conocí a una mujer extraordinaria en la, que, cual, en la cual eh, sigo muy agradecida eh, con ella, que desafortunadamente falleció en 2020, que se llama Adriana Aguirre Vere, en la cual eh, siento que eh, también ella tenía una eh, energía muy particular en la que motivaba eh, muchas mujeres eh, que era como el remolino que te hace como envolver eh, y hace sentir emociones muy bonitas en la que eh, tú dices, entonces no solo yo estoy viendo eso, sino que alguien más eh, lo está viendo, ¿no? lo está viviendo y yo creo que eh, esas personas valen la pena como nombrarlas y yo creo que hay tantas mujeres, tantas personas que estamos acá, que estamos buscando el buen común, por algo estamos acá y yo eh, donde quiera que esté la compañera Adriana, pues la, siempre la honro con mi corazón y siempre la, eh, la, la voy a querer siempre porque fue una de las mujeres que realmente Siento que fue quien me motivó, me acompañó muchas veces porque a veces también trabajar en la sociedad no es fácil. Tomar ese sendero de abrir caminos, de ser la, la primera mujer, de decir yo no quiero esto en mi vida, no quiero sufrir violencia, Quiero hacer algo para que las futuras niñas, las futuras generaciones, las jóvenes realmente tengan ese panorama de tener sus derechos, conocer sus derechos y todo eso. Y realmente encontrar personas, eh, tantas organizaciones también. Y aquí presente está Carla Monse y las otras compañeras que nos acompañan en Chiapas, México. Sinceramente siento que ha sido ese acompañamiento que necesitamos ¿no? a las mujeres de los pueblos originarios. In indigenous communities each people has different type of beliefs, either we believe in God or sometimes uh, some sort of spirituality, but we that help us find our purpose. What's our purpose in life? Um, I want to honor Adriana Guerrero who I me I met um, a few years ago, and unfortunately, she passed away. Uh, but she was really, she really had that energy that motivated me. It was like a storm in a, in a way that all of these good emotions I could recognize in herself, and I didn't feel alone. I could see that other women were experiencing what I was experiencing, 
Uh, and it's, it's a feeling and it's very important that as women we recognize uh, that common goal, that purpose and that good life that we want to live. And wherever Adriana is right now, I, I always bring, have her close to my heart and honor her memory because it's really uh, what we, what we want to do, live a life free of violence in our communities. Um, and a society, uh, in, in the society it's very hard to be a woman and break, break the mold, break, uh, create new paths and really go out of the established roles we have to fill in our communities. And I don't want any, any other kids in the future or any other woman to suffer this. And my work is really rooted in this. We also have uh, other artisans in the room and other women that have been working with artisans. And I also want to honor that. Esto es una pequeña eh, contexto para que también tengan eh, un, una idea porque también, o sea, no es fácil eh, enfrentarse y subir al barco, como dicen, de decir quiero ser y quiero eh, ser el ejemplo de las demás compañeras y que realmente tengamos esos eh, recursos, eh, oportunidades para poder dirigirnos hacia nuestros sueños. Eh, Impacto ha sido una de las organizaciones, eh, disculpen si las demás organizaciones aquí presentes, pero eh, específicamente Impacto porque he trabajado y he, hemos estado 10 años con la organización y ha sido uno de los caminos eh, pues, eh, que, que hemos tenido más colaboraciones, más oportunidades en trabajar eh, pues, de la mano. Eh, y siento que hay muchas organizaciones en Chiapas que realmente pues tengan el, eh, ese mismo transparencia, eh, la colectividad y el objetivo que queremos todos, ¿no? eh, llegar al desarrollo eh, sostenible, el buen vivir como lo decimos en los pueblos originarios. So um, it's very hard to take the, the a leadership role, to be the example for other women. Uh, the opportunity that we have and to show other women that we can fulfill our dreams. And it's very important, and I want to mention Impacto because they're here and because they are the organization that I've been working with together and really partnered that uh, how key their role has been to, to create the conditions and to have these opportunities to grow together, but also uh, I want to encourage the other organizations that want to work in Chiapas to have that same transparency and collaboration uh, so that we can build those uh, opportunities for the good life, or El Buen Vivir, um, and we can continue creating partnerships for success. Sé que ya solo me quedan unos segundos, pero que quisiera decir que como empresaria, como mujer del pueblo originario, pues tenemos nuestro propio eh, proceso y que realmente eh, te, eh, tengan mucho en cuenta a las inversiones, inversionistas que eh, nos dan financiamiento, que realmente nosotras eh, no solo eh, pensamos en trabajar, trabajar, sino que también tenemos nuestra propia historia, nuestra familia, la sociedad y todo eso, eh, tenerlo mucho en cuenta y yo creo que si realmente queremos tener un impacto social, pues justo es eso, pensar en el buen vivir, eh, en, porque nosotras tenemos nuestro propio ritmo de trabajo y no somos eh, maquinarias, no somos máquinas para eh, poder desarrollar miles de productos al mismo tiempo, sino que eh, todo tiene eh, su proceso, su historia y todo eso. Muchas gracias. So I know I have uh, just a few minutes, but as an indigenous um, entrepreneur and woman, I, I just want, to, want you to know that we have our own process. And for any investors in, interested in supporting our process, uh, I want you to know that for us, it's important not only to work, our history, our family, our society, that's real impact, taking into account all of those things from our perspective, what it really means to have a good life, 
what a good rhythm of work is, that's impact. Uh, we don't want to be machines. We can't develop millions of products. We cannot follow a logic of work that uh, is based out of machines. And that's what I want you to have in mind uh, when you partner with us. So uh, thank you so much, Juana. And with that, we want to, to turn it over to Patrick. Patrick, we've heard uh, from Hannah her, her story, a uh, very impactful story. And we would really like for, for you to tell us a little bit more about you, about your work in Haiti, and the same. No? What barriers, uh, what are some things that have been difficult for you? What opportunities do you see? How can we create uh, innovation in how we finance uh, projects like yours? Thank you. Uh Good morning, everyone. Dana, Sibas, Juana, so it's an honor to be here. Um, well, a little bit about me. I am from Haiti. My mom came from the north side of Haiti and my father on the south side. So um, I never had the opportunity um, to spend a lot of time in rural Haiti when I was uh, a kid. But I was always driven by the, by the uh, feeling that I need to do something, you know, to make an impact in rural Haiti. And with that, um, I grew up in Port Prince. Like, I don't know how many of you have been to um, uh, Haiti. Port Prince is the main city, the capital city. That's where you have all the uh, financial uh, deals happening, the hospital, the good schools. So uh, I grew up here in Port Prince. Then um, after that, um, after high school, I did my, uh, my first degree in Haiti, and then I, I headed to the US, been in the US military for a few years. And then after that, I decided to come back uh, in Haiti after the earthquake. That was uh, the turning, turning point uh, in my life. And uh, as Dana said in the introduction, when I moved to Haiti, I spearheaded uh, um, the Zafen program with Franck Rosé, the Paul University, uh, a group of the, the people in the diaspora. And uh, the main focus was, okay, let's see how we can um, build the business ecosystem in Haiti. The entrepreneurial ecosystem was uh, deeply affected, really weak, and a lot of people in Haiti were suffering. So we did, I did, uh, we, the model was to finance uh, direct enterprises uh, through an online platform called Zafen. And I was at the honor to meet a lot of entrepreneurs throughout Haiti to hear about the story and, uh, and what the business plan, uh, the, what we call them, <laughs> the memo, and, and try to find funding from them. Uh, after that, I, I had the opportunity um, to work for Wood Capital. As I said, impact first agricultural lender, you know, what to my heart, sending me, been traveling throughout the country to meet coffee farmers, cocoa farmers, um, rice farmers. The, the main idea is, uh, is to make sure that the, 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 the production, we export the product, why export is because uh, it's, it's in foreign currency. So, you know, between the U.S. dollar and the Asian gold, there's a, there's a fluctuation rate happening. So um, uh, we, we saw the impact. We saw um, the impact that a loan can have on the co-op and the impact of the co-op on the member. Um, doing all that, but it's been difficult. Yeah, I need to be honest. I mean, Haiti is a very, very difficult place to operate. And uh, the ecosystem is really weak, so we had to build the ecosystem, you know, trying to find some pathological partners, like we have some of them in the, in the room. I would like to acknowledge Clay, HDI, and, and, and Zomi Agricole. And uh, I will say the, the, the best thing just to be honest, the best thing that happened to uh, Wuwo Enterprises in Haiti and uh, locally led organization is the arrival of the Kellogg Foundation. Why? Because the Kellogg Foundation 
took the time to understand the reality and, and they, they promote what I call a choice-based philanthropy uh, rooted in localization. And, and with that, we had the opportunity to, you know, to gather around a lot of uh, enterprises in three main uh, depart, uh, depart, geographic departments, the South, the Central Plateau, and the West, like, uh, like we call it the Central uh, Corridor for, for the Kellogg Foundation. And then we, we, we decided to, to base our operation on a Creole word that we call combit. Combit is like a, 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 a word that when you gather a bunch of unengaged organizations having the same mission, and our mission in Haiti is to make sure forming communities, they can live in the, in the communities, they, get, get, uh, uh, they can create wealth, and their son and daughters can actually be proud of being Haitian. Um, challenges, we have many. We have many challenges, but I will say that we, we the local commu uh, community and the local organization, we are driven by challenges. Because in every challenge, we see an opportunity. And the opportunity in Haiti, they, they contest. We have contest opportunities. Uh, and right now, um, after 10 years, when we, we learn, we have a lot of lessons learned, we made a lot of investments, I mean, some, some really good investments, uh, some always bad investments as well. And we, we sat down and we created uh, a consortium. And that we, that's why I'm going to pitch up about uh, this afternoon. We call it the Haiti Food System Alliance. And the Haiti Food System Alliance um, we said, okay, we, all our, the lesson learned, the, 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 the failures we had over the years, so we say, okay, we already know exactly what happened. So the best, it happened because we didn't have the pathological partners to, to do it. So the, 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 the consortium is, is comprised of 14 organizations, well-known organizations in Haiti, doing good work with a very distinct uh, expertise. Uh, and that we we seeing the progress. We are seeing the progress. We we the, our voices are getting uh, are being heard by the government because the government in Haiti also is a very key partner. But since Haiti is a country uh, financed by philanthropy and aid in, in at eighty percent, and since we have a, a lack of enterprises that can receive the tax revenue, so the government is really weak. And, and doing that, I think, um, I'm, I'm really happy that the Kellogg Foundation, they have the HOPE, you know, the, the HOPE program, Pockets of HOPE program, so willing to raise uh, $90 million for Haiti uh, in the next three years. So uh, with that, and the partners we have in the room, the, the network we already established in, in the country, we see uh, uh, a, a pathway to what I call systemic change. And systemic change for us is to make sure that uh, with the Food System Alliance, people can eat at least on a daily basis. Uh, the community is safe. The kids can go to school. And actually, the, the businesses we created, the businesses we're supporting, they're making enough money to hire people, um, tax revenues for the government to collect and make it like a, 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 a drafting a better future for Asian in general. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and listening to Juana, I'm not, I'm, I understand Spanish, but I'm not too fluent, but uh, Juana's story is, is similar to a lot of women I know. In, in World Haiti, a lot of women organizations, a lot of women entrepreneurs. And uh, I'm really happy that I had the opportunity to connect with her. I think between Haiti and, and Mexico, we're gonna have a, a better collaboration, some exchange. And I'm here uh, until tomorrow. If you have a, a more questions about Haiti, I'm happy to connect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, Juana. I think that there, there's, one, there's one key thing that both Juana and Pat, 
Patek remind us is that those enterprises, those ecosystem players, or at the front line of changing people's lives every single day. So for us as a foundation, we've had the honor and the privilege to see it firsthand, and we want to share this with you. Um, when we listen to the news and we listen to all of the barriers, we, we don't wanna be selfish. We are so excited about the opportunities that we see, and we want to engage you around those opportunities and share what we've learned and what we've seen in terms of the power and really efficacy of those organizations. So with that, we want to invite you to pitches. So as I think both Juana and Patrick alluded, as well um, with eight of their other partners, they will be pitching at the end of the day today. So we're inviting you to not only participate to the pitch, engage with them, but also consider this a long-term engagement because we've been partnered with, with them for over a decade. So we know that in some ways there are some tangible short-term return on investment that we know are possible, but the kind of transformation that we're, we're all are talking about, even as we think about the SDGs, is going to take long-term partnership, and we are excited to explore partnership with you. So with that, because we can't leave this room and not glean and learn from you, from your reflections, and we invite you to really sit deep with your reflections, we're going to organize ourselves into two workshops um, and if we can please maybe turn the next slide. Thank you so much. So we're going to be spending the rest of our time um, around really three conversations. Two will be workshops. No, okay. But I think we have them on the table. Okay, so let me I want to walk you through, through the workshops. So what we'll do, we'll have two series of workshops and on your tables, you do have questions and we have post-its and we'll have a first series of conversation which is about 19 minutes. And the one, Amy, Amy is our timekeeper, so Amy. <laughs> yes, please Amy, 10 minutes. What is it, 10 minutes, okay, thank you Amy. So we'll have 10 minute per workshop. So we'll have two workshops. The third workshop is about 10 minute conversations. The questions are on your table. And the invitation is for you to really do share your insights, your lesson, your doubts, because together this is the kind of conversation that we hope can move us into truly practical steps forward. We're asked that on your table, somebody serves as a host. We will need a timekeeper and we're asking for a volunteer, thank you in advance. We'll need a timekeeper, and we'll also need somebody who will gather together the post-its, and those post-its will be posted at the end of the workshop onto um, this board. And the reason why we're doing this is because we are truly going to follow up with the gathered um, insight, uh, because we want to share with the broader community what you've um, shared and continue to exchange with you in the future. And at the end of the second workshop, we do open to, we hope to have an open discussion. If you have questions for us, we're happy to take them, but most importantly, we do also want to hear from you. And I will be here if there's any, um, any clarity that is needed. And with that, Sebastian, uh, if you wanna add anything. Yes, just, uh, we're gonna have one table that is Spanish speaking. Yes. And whoever wants to engage in that table is gonna be here in the front. And just, I'll be collecting your post-its, please. As they start coming up, we really wanna capture some ideas. We're, we're planning to, to uh, do a um, report out of that at the end. And so we, it's gonna be super key that you bring your ideas to the boards up front as you can. And uh, yeah, that's it, thank you. Thank you. And the Creole table is over there, if you're more comfortable with the Creole table. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's with great sadness that we're wrapping up. <laughs> but so we'll open it up for now uh, for a bit of a high level reflection um, and your comments, but most importantly, inviting you and reminding you that we will have 10 amazing pitches at the end of the day. 
So do not miss the pitches. Invite your colleagues, invite your partners to come and hear for yourself exactly the kind of impact and the kind of return, really, that those social enterprises are having in Haiti and rural Mexico. And with that, we, I will pass it to Sebas, who's going to read a couple of high-level comments in terms of um, takeaways from your conversations, and then we'll open it up for further comments, reflections, and inviting you to continue this conversation with us this week and beyond. Thank you, Sebas. Yeah, so unsurprisingly, we have a, a lot of uh, comments and ideas uh, that are focused on community, and that's uh, really, really good to see. Um, I'll just read them in Spanish and English. Representación de comunidades y herramientas de difusión fue una idea también que salió. Representation of communities and tools for um, broadcasting or promoting their work. Um, there's a lot of them like this in, in terms of equity, in terms of um, shifting the responsibility from communities of measuring impact. O también hay otras ideas que tienen que ver con que las comunidades no sean las encargadas de medir el impacto, que no se les imponga modelos de medición de impacto que sean ajenos a sus necesidades. Um, trust building, a lot of trust, uh, trust-based philanthropy, trust-based trust lending. Um, so this is really, I think, what a lot of comments are coming to is trust your partners, trust the communities you're working with. Eh, muchas ideas son sobre la confianza, sobre la importancia de eh, confiar en las comunidades, eh, hacer préstamos basados en la confianza. Eh, me imagino que tiene que ver mucho también con, con el tema de las garantías y de cómo manejamos el riesgo y pues bueno, este llamado a confiar. Um, also a lot about data and how data is collected and different models of data. Um, data that is important for communities. Um, solutions that are not one solution fits all, but actually um, solutions or measuring instruments that are based on communities' needs and what community wants to measure, and what uh, indicators are based on the prosperity of community. Entonces, también muchos datos y muchos indicadores que tienen que ver con la comunidad, qué, qué cosas son importantes para las comunidades medir, ¿Cuál es esa medida de prosperidad que esté definida por la comunidad? And there's also a trend uh, around gender equity and the role of women balancing out uh, the work of women at home and with economic, economic development. Um, the, the right of women to take control of quality and their, their products and, and account uh, Accounting methods, uh, what, are the, what are some of the capacity building needed to be done there? Entonces, también hay, hay muchas respuestas que tienen que ver con el rol de las mujeres y un enfoque de género. El eh, tener un balance mejor entre el trabajo del hogar y, y las actividades económicas, el tener eh, algunas capacitaciones específicas para las mujeres. So, that's primarily a very big summary of you know, what we have here, very good ideas around um, barriers and how we eliminate the language barriers. Uh, another idea about diaspora as a source of impact capital. Um, and a lot of uh, ideas around collaboration and, and innovation in collaborating. So that's a very quick summary, but if anyone wants to participate and give us any additional thoughts, or questions that you may have for the panelists, or uh, this is, we have a few minutes to engage in conversation. Entonces, si alguien más también quiere comentar algo y que tenemos unos minutos para, para platicar. Um, so I, uh, we had a really great conversation on our table here, uh, especially because we were very lucky to have different organizations um, from around Latin America, but also uh, the, artisans and the indigenous women are actually on the ground and who we are reaching and working with for many years already. And this sort of like sent me into a thought of everything that we're doing and the impact that we make is incredible, 
But what are sort of my question for, for Dana and for Sebas, if this exists and if so, uh, how maybe this should be made into a system that once an organization, whether it's the Kellogg Foundation or our smaller organizations that work uh, in smaller communities, the impact on the work that we do, that's great, but how do we document that? Uh, what, what we teach the, the communities and what we teach the organizations, how do we document that so that once the funding organizations are gone, they can continue to replicate without, without organizations that are funding? How can they you know, pass that on to generations, not just because they learned it and they experienced it, but actually leaving them with a manual, a guide of Throughout the project, this is what's worked, and this is how we made it successful, and here's your manual so that you can teach others in your community um, to replicate the same thing without needing to be, well, not that we don't wanna exist anymore, but we're not gonna be all here forever, right? So yeah, um, that's like a question that I had, if that exists, and if not, maybe considering that we, that that should be definitely a thing for long-lasting impact. Y bueno, en español, eh, algo que, que estaba pensando en todo lo que hablábamos aquí, eh, de las soluciones a corto plazo, a largo plazo, eh, lo que ha funcionado, lo que ha faltado, eh, todo lo que estamos hablando aquí, que una vez que una organización eh, llega a una zona y hace una inversión y se forma un proyecto y es exitoso y todo, ¿Qué queda después de eso? No eh, No solamente es importante que quede aprendizaje, que quede una manera de operar y, y nuevas organizaciones en las comunidades y todo, pero creo que también es importante preguntarnos, ¿es importante dejar un manual o que haya una documentación? Que es justo lo que, lo que decíamos de esto es lo que fue exitoso y esto es lo que tú como comunidad, como grupo, como organización rural puedes continuar eh, trabajando para enseñar a otros que esa es la manera exitosa en la que una organización grande llegó aquí y creó un impacto, porque de esa manera pues evitamos que tenga que estar una organización grande constantemente o dependiendo constantemente de, de, que se, de que existan fondos para este tipo de cosas, ¿no? Y pues mi pregunta es eso, si eso existe, si consideramos que es importante y hasta dónde eh, se puede llevar eso. Burning, burning comments, no burning comments. I know you have burning comments, but it's okay. It's okay for now. Um, I think just kind of high level reflection, um, and I'm using the word reflection intentionally because the task and the work to move capital and to move resources and the way required to meet the challenge, the urgency and the power of you all and of community is a collective task. Because um, Sebas talked about positionality earlier, we each as organizations and partners play different roles in this broader ecosystem. We know that you are at the front line of change every single day, but we also know that we have the urgent need, even when we think about the SDGs broadly, globally, we know we're not meeting them in 2030, we know that we have an urgency to act and to act now and to figure it out. So I'm saying that to say, I would say let's engage because what you raise is exactly correct. But we also know that at this time, even as different actors and partners in the ecosystem, our language to talk about this is different. What we mean sometimes is different. So there's a lot of work that has to happen, I think, to get us aligned around incentives, definitions, actions, lessons learned in a way that is effective um, so that, to your point, we are not dealing with the same issues in 10, 20 years. So I, I would broaden the invitation. I think that is exactly the what um, in engaging with us on our end, engaging with you collectively. And hopefully today is not the beginning of a conversation because we know those conversations have started already, but we hope it's a milestone in the conversation and we can use it as a linchpin to continue. And we, we have some ideas around how do we increase the visibility and channels for your voice and your lesson and for the field and the sector. So we'll definitely engage and please, 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 please continue to share with us also what's not working, particularly what's not working. Because I think the more that we know what we need to leave in the past, I think the faster 
we can move forward and be effective. And thank you so much for your work and your presence. Thank you.